Why can Alzheimer's disease be so hard to recognize? Many caretakers find themselves thrown into their roles with very little warning. But if Alzheimer's disease is progressive and takes time to do its damage, then why would this be? Why wouldn't there be more prep time, as it were? In this video, I'll run through 10 possible reasons why the earliest stages of cognitive impairment can be difficult to spot. Just a brief caveat, we're talking about the so-called early stage of any form of dementia. There is an informal subtype of Alzheimer's disease that is referred to as early onset. Even early onset Alzheimer's will theoretically be broken down into an early, a middle, and a late stage. It's just that in the case of early onset Alzheimer's, the entire experience of cognitive decline happens to a younger person than with other varieties, such as late onset. 10 reasons early Alzheimer's might be missed. At present, dementia does not have a single definitive test. And even if it did, it may only be administered when there's already behavioral evidence of cognitive decline. I've gotten more into the tests that are available in a dedicated video. Suffice it to say here that evidence of Alzheimer's can be detected using a spectrum of brain imaging tests, such as CT scans, MRIs, and PET scan. However, for the time being, there really isn't a go-to laboratory test at least not one that is cost-effective, as they say. It's not as straightforward as finding out you have strep throat, for example. As I understand it, out of the common forms of imaging, the PET scan is the most clinically instructive. Unfortunately, it also tends to be the most expensive on average. It's not uncommon, therefore, for doctors to adopt a wait-and-see approach, as opposed to expecting insurance companies or patients to foot the bill while they subject them to a battery of these expensive tests. And once dementia is suspected on other grounds, more on that in a moment, then the PET scan and other forms of imaging become a bit superfluous. I mean, if grandma has impoverished language ability, memory problems, poor problem solving, and so on, it's probable that she has some form of dementia. It's not likely that the doctor is going to say, let's get a PET scan. Having the PET scan is going to add very little information from a diagnostic point of view at that point. Number two, cognitive assessments can be hit or miss. Typically, the main diagnostic tool is an array of cognitive assessments, such as the Mini Mental State Examination, or MMSE. I've planned to do a dedicated video on that, so let me know in the comments if that would be of any interest to you. The major pros of the MMSE are that it's cheap and it's easy to administer. It's just basically a bunch of questions and memory exercises. It may only take 10 or 15 minutes for a patient to complete it, and at the end of it, there's a grade, not unlike a test you might have taken in school, but the point is it fixes an objective value on your loved one's cognitive status. Now, the interpretation of that value is somewhat controversial. The MMSE and related tests are supposedly pretty good at detecting dementia when it's already present in its full-blown form, but it's not nearly as reliable an indicator when we're talking about early stages or mild cognitive impairment. The test may not be a good predictor of who's going to convert from mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, into more severe forms of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. In other words, and to speak unscientifically, the test isn't 100% trustworthy until after you've passed the crucial early stage. And of course, this video is about why is it sometimes not the case that Alzheimer's is detected in the earliest stage. And in the case of the MMSE, the answer is because the test is better once the Alzheimer's disease is already in full swing. So this sort of a test won't be as decisive when it comes to detecting the earliest stirrings of dementia. Number three, you're not going to find it if you're not looking for it. Another thing to consider is that doctors usually will not subject their patients to withering cognitive scrutiny unless there's some reason to think that they already have some kind of an impairment. This one is worth pondering. I mean, after all, you can put it flatly in the form of a question. Would you want to go to a doctor who is always trying to determine if you had Alzheimer's disease? He was always trying to catch you out, as it were, at having some kind of cognitive impairment. It would probably get to feel a little bit like you were being cross-examined. But admittedly, our intuitions might be a bit conflicted here. For instance, once your loved one has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it would be very natural to wish 
that that diagnosis had come earlier on the assumption that maybe something more could have been done. But on the other hand, when you think about it, what could have been put into place to detect it earlier? They would have had to have gone through cognitive assessments when it might have felt fairly invasive and unwanted, both from the standpoint of the patient and possibly from the standpoint of the family. So doctors are in a really tough spot here. And here's something else to consider. Once a doctor does have evidence of cognitive impairment, he or she cannot really keep quiet about it. In some states, if doctors have reason to believe that a patient has dementia, then they are under a legal obligation to report it. And that would mean reporting it to places like driver's license bureaus. Now, this doesn't apply to every state. There are also additional limitations or possibly additional obligations that a doctor might shoulder in a given context, depending on his or her HMO agreement, on the contours of their medical license, on their professional insurance policies, and on any other professional agreements that they have entered into. But in general, the more evidence a doctor accumulates that a particular patient has dementia, the more liability the doctor assumes unless he or she reports it to someone. Number four, the nature of doctor visits. Think for a minute about the average doctor visit. Maybe you get 10 or 15 minutes of face time with your doctor after you've sat through successive waiting intervals. Physicians, like many other professionals, are overworked. And we might put it this way, there are too many patients for too few doctors in the current environment. All of that is a recipe for the fact that a doctor may not know any given patient particularly well. And especially for our topic, the doctor might not know you or your loved one well enough to make judgments about cognitive decline when they're subtle. I mean, a person who is just manifestly cognitively impaired is probably detectable to anybody around regardless of background. But in some cases when the impairment might be mild, you might have to know the person in order to pick up on oddities of their behavior. Now, another factor is that apart from wellness checks, what motivates you to go to the doctor? Well, an injury or an illness usually. And being in pain or being sick can cause you to act differently even if you're perfectly normally cognitively functioning. Now, an illustration of this is the phenomenon known as white coat hypertension. This happens when you have higher blood pressure readings at the doctor's office than you do anywhere else. Now, of course, blood pressure isn't a behavior. Just being in a healthcare setting can make a lot of people feel out of sorts. And then that can affect their behavior. And so the point is, a lot of people might act oddly at a doctor's office, and there's not a whole lot that you can judge from that apart from the fact that they are not comfortable being in doctor's offices. So if someone seems to be acting a bit uncharacteristic or a bit on edge, what's the doctor supposed to think? That they just have you know, some analog of white coat hypertension or that they've got the stirrings of cognitive decline. Sometimes for doctors, it can be a bit difficult to disentangle those differences. Now, of course, it's possible that a doctor might know you or your loved one well enough, and it's possible that a 10-minute doctor visit every couple of odd months might be enough to elicit odd behavior in the presence of a doctor. But overall, doctor visits are short and don't give a lot of time for noticing anything of relevance. Even less can we expect that those 10-minute visits even stacked up are going to provide enough history accumulated over time for the doctor to have a contrast class, something to judge against. And the plain fact is that in the 21st century, doctors simply do not have the intimate knowledge of patients that their counterparts may have had in the past, back at a time when doctors made house calls and everybody in the town was on a first-name basis. And add to that the fast pace of most managed care environments and the overworking aspect, and you've got basically a recipe for saying you can't expect the doctor to be the first line of detection when it comes to cognitive impairment. Number five, maybe you're too close. It's usually the family who's the first to notice that something is amiss. And the doctors rely on this kind of insight. And if you bring it up to your doctor about your loved one maybe being a little bit off, then it'll be on the doctor's radar. And if you don't, then it won't be. Of course, as an aside, in other videos, I do get into scenarios where other people, for example, police officers, might be put in a position where they have to report your loved one or where they notice his or her behavior being odd or uncharacteristic. For example, if a police officer might ticket a person for driving the wrong way down a one-way street or for driving over caution cones or for driving through newly poured concrete, as indeed my dad once did, then the police officer might have to report 
that incident to a physician or to a driver's license bureau. But apart from that, it's often going to fall to the family. But there is a problem that arises in the context of the family, and that is that you could be too close. And here's what I mean. A lot of the earliest signs are going to be subtle, and it's easy to rationalize them, or it's easy to just go, did they just behave badly or oddly or uncharacteristically? And then you kind of file it, but then you kind of dismiss it. And over time, there can be these subtle changes that you're not wanting to push the issue at any given time. And then they just build up and you just don't notice it. When you live with someone day in and day out, you can actually miss these subtle changes. And then suddenly they snowball and somebody else from the outside has to be the one to kind of notice it. We've got this really odd thing where doctors do not have enough face time with the patient or enough history to notice it. But on the other hand, families might be too close. And the idea of an outsider in the sense that I'm talking about would be somebody who has history with your loved one. Maybe it's a friend from the past or a coworker that they, somebody they used to work with, or a person like me who I was living in the house when I grew up, then I moved out. But when I re-entered the home, I had the benefit of number one, the history with my dad, something to compare it against. I knew he was acting oddly because I knew what he was like before. But also I had been gone from the home for some time. So I hadn't been present as those changes started. I noticed everything once those changes had sort of changed his whole personality. So my mom didn't notice them. And there were some other reasons. We'll get into that in just a minute. But I noticed it because I had both the distance and the history. So it's a delicate line. And that's another reason why early stage detection is sometimes missed. Now, number six is not thinking along medical lines. Even if you do detect the changes, like I did, I knew something was wrong, but I wasn't immediately thinking along medical lines. I didn't immediately go, oh, this is Alzheimer's disease. Because I just, I had never had experience with that. I'm not a healthcare professional. And that's just not the way my mind was working at the time. Even after I had the experience with my dad, I've been doing the project. I stepped away from the project for a while. Okay, well, my family and I went to a outdoor musical and in the back row, and we were somewhat separated from the rest of the audience, there was an elderly couple and the woman was tearing the program apart. And I immediately thought, boy, that's kind of inconsiderate. I mean, what is she doing? Preparing for scrapbooking? And I was irritated. Well, in preparing for this video and some others that I'm shooting, I realized in reviewing some of the notes that that's a sign of dementia. So here even I, after four years of caring for my dad and four years of him being in a home, making videos for this Alzheimer's channel, I, my mind still did not immediately recognize that when I saw a sign of it. Now, my dad didn't have that particular behavior. That's not the point. The point, though, is that I think it takes some training. You have to get used to thinking of it in terms of this is a sign of dementia. And for people who are not in actively in a healthcare environment or a psychology department, it's not natural necessarily to think that way. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Now, this is obviously going to be highly variable. If you are in healthcare, then maybe this kind of thing is top of mind for you. But it wasn't for me. Number seven, symptoms are intermittent. Now, even if you do consider clinical explanations for your loved one's odd behavior, Alzheimer's is tricky. It's just tricky. A person can flip between periods of lucidity and periods of confusion. And in the early stages, their periods of disorientation may not be particularly pronounced. And they're certainly not going to be constant. They're not going to be continual. So they're going to come and go. Everything's going to be intermittent. And once again, we're asking the question, why is it sometimes missed? And it's missed because it's not like they're just running a fever and you know something's wrong. It's like, you know, that was odd. And then you press your loved one maybe about it. And then they seem to have snapped out of it or they seem to have remembered what it was that they had forgotten or whatever it is. So it's very difficult because of the intermittent nature of the symptoms. Not only that, but, you know, you want to think well of your loved one. Most people do. When uncharacteristic behaviors start to crop up, it's easy to just write them off, to say there's some explanation for it, fill in the blank, and you move along with your life. An example of that is my dad used to go shopping on the same day that he paid bills. So he would go and drop these envelopes with these checks off at the post office. Well, he started to mail the shopping list on accident or he would forget to mail the bill. But then he would come back home, everybody would realize it, we'd have a good laugh, he would have a good laugh, and he'd go, oh, I'm, you know, 
just absent-minded. I had too much on my mind. I was listening to the ball game, whatever it was. And then the next week it would be fine. And the week after that, it would be fine until it wasn't fine and it happened again. This can go on for a long time, this back and forth. Now, one idea here would be to keep a journal of your observations. Here you walk a delicate line. When do you start keeping a journal? Because now you're in the same position that the doctor's in. Should you start right now, you know, when mom and dad maybe don't have any symptoms? Should you start keeping a journal just so that you can be, you know, immediately able to spring into action in the event of any small sign of cognitive decline? So I would say probably once somebody is manifesting an odd behavior or something that is like my dad, mailing the shopping list. Okay, it happens once. Now it happens twice. Now maybe start making a note of it. I didn't do that, but in retrospect, that probably would have been a good idea. Number eight, personality types. Personalities can come into play. Think, for example, of a married couple. One partner is dominant and take charge, and the other is more acquiescent or passive. Well, if it's the dominant person who's in decline, then the person who's more passive might not want to make an issue of it. And that's even if they do notice it, which, as we've been saying this whole video so far, it's hard to notice sometimes. It could be either partner, any partner who's got the more dominant personality and somebody else who tends to be more submissive. In my family's case, it did happen to be my dad who was the more assertive, and my mom just assumed all the time that my dad would take care of things, so she deferred to him. And for decades, uh, you know, that's what happened. And he was reliable. In addition to that, my mom always avoids conflict. She's very conflict averse. So she wasn't going to push it. You know, if my dad forgot something, you know, she might say it. She would make a note of it, but she really wouldn't push him on it. And in the event that they were both in the doctor's office together, she wasn't going to be the one to throw him under the bus the way she would have thought about it to the doctor and say, well, you know, he forgot this or he forgot that because it might have made him look bad. So in hindsight, it's not at all surprising that I was the one eventually who had to push those issues because I don't avoid conflict, I guess. I mean, you know, so I was the one who wrote his doctor a letter. I was the one who had to bring these things up. And she was probably both too close per the previous consideration, but personality also plays in as we just saw. Number nine, duplicity. Now, in my mom and dad's case, the relational dynamic, the personality factors also led to something else, which I'll bring up here, and it's a little bit more delicate. Sometimes the afflicted person might try to hide their affliction, might try to hide their memory lapses, might try to hide that they're not as sharp as they once were, that they're forgetting things and so on. So when my dad was still driving around, my mom was working, he was retired, 22 year difference between the two of them, I would get a call hey, forgot my keys, you know, left the house, locked myself out. Can I come by and grab keys from you? And I say, sure, you know, and I give him the keys and think it's no problem. And then I don't hear from my dad, you know, for a month after that. I mean, I see him at dinner. He seems okay. And I just think that happens. You lock yourself out of the house. Later, years later, I found out from neighbors that he had given spare keys to them. Now, how many spare keys were floating around out there? I'm not exactly sure. But the point is, he didn't want to always call me for the keys. Now, you could say, well, it's because he didn't want to put me out or whatever. But there's also a suspicion that I have that he just didn't want any one person to get an accurate picture of how many times he was losing his keys. Now, what's interesting there is there's a kind of a combination, you know, of lucid and confused because he had to be with it enough to come up with this plan, to make the keys, to distribute them. And he'd have to remember the last person that he asked. I'm tending to think that he wasn't that sophisticated. Probably he asked the neighbors first. And if they weren't available, then he just went down the list calling people until he reached me. I was probably just further down on the list. You get the point. I think there's some kind of covering your butt type you know, I mean, anybody's going to want to put a plan in place. If they think they might forget something, they're going to set a reminder, set an alarm. But I think in this case, there was also the possibility that he was trying to hide the nature of his memory lapses. Now, I'm not saying that they have to be nefarious. Obviously, that's a painful thing for a person to realize about themselves. And to a certain extent, I think my dad wanted to be self-reliant. He always was that way. So I think some of this was a self-test that he put into place. I remember this has nothing to do with the keys, but... There was a time when we went over to somebody else's house and my dad just left, like in the middle of this get together, he just left. 
And he was taking a walk. And I think what he was doing, frankly, was trying to test himself to see whether he could walk and find his way back. That is my impression. When you think about it that way, I think a person who knows that they're experiencing some kind of a decline might periodically try to test themselves, possibly in a desperate hope that they're going to be able to preserve you know, their cognitive level without seeing any further decline. And I know that my dad was desperately trying to cling to his freedom. There was a big issue with the car and the car keys and not being able to drive. And that was heartbreaking, but it had to be done because he just objectively became unreliable behind the wheel. So that had to be done. But I know that he was thinking along those lines at, at various points in the decline. And so it might have played into the scenario that I was describing with the, with the house keys. In other words, in his case, there was a bit of scheming, I think. And you might run into that as well. Number 10, and finally, there's a similarity to normal aging. So the final reason here is probably the best known. Early stage dementia may not be all that different looking from just normal aging. And the idea here is supposed to be that normal aging is, it's vexatious, it can present problems, but it's not supposed to be as onerous or as harmful as dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Now, when you think about normal aging, I'm using quotes there because there is controversy as to whether or not we should think of this as normal. If you look at journal articles, you will see that there are clinical and scholarly challenges to the notion that there is such a thing as benign senescent forgetfulness, as it's occasionally called. But the idea is that some forgetfulness may not be a major cause for concern. And in fact, many elderly adults do have a certain amount of cognitive decline, a certain amount of memory lapse, but it doesn't get to an egregious point where they have out and out Alzheimer's disease. So where to draw the line there, it's quite a bit difficult. The point is many people are never officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. Now that doesn't mean there's nothing to diagnose, but I think just sort of intuitively, it is clear that there's a certain subset of the aging population that has some loss of memory, but never develop into the kind of severe memory impairment that you see in Alzheimer's, other people do. And another diagnostic wrinkle is that there is something else, which we mentioned earlier, called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. And this is another difficult one, because MCI is sometimes listed as an early stage or a pre-stage of dementia, and it may fully well be. But on the other hand, some people who have MCI never convert into Alzheimer's. In summary, there can be a variety of reasons why Alzheimer's or forms of dementia of any kind can be difficult to diagnose, especially in their earliest stages. There's no straightforward test. Cognitive assessments, while good, are not perfect. Doctors usually aren't actively trying to find evidence of impairment in their normally functioning patients. They typically wait until they're prompted by someone close to the patient. Most routine in-office examinations aren't particularly well-suited to discovering cognitive dysfunction. For their part, family members may not see the forest for the trees, as it were. They may not be thinking along medical lines when they do witness odd behavior. In any case, symptoms can be maddeningly intermittent. Personality types can come into play. The dementia sufferer may be actively trying to hide their decline. And overall, Mild cognitive impairment and early stage Alzheimer's can also appear indistinguishable from the allegedly benign memory problems that can be a part of quote unquote normal aging. It's a difficult situation. I mean, just bottom line. Possibly I missed something of importance in my list. So if you think so, if you've got something to add to the conversation, feel free to drop a comment below. Of course, to a certain extent, this channel, this project in general, the Alzheimer's Proof Project, are intended to help improve the situation as best that we can. A lot of my content is geared toward trying to help people who are caretaking in the house and trying to help them to do that for as long as possible. So there are certain interventions that you can try in order to secure the home environment better or in order to make everything a little bit more manageable. But then there's that point, that point where in-home care becomes no longer feasible and trying to determine when that is, is maddeningly difficult on its own. For insight maybe or help with that, please see some of the content that I'm working on right now. Those are the kinds of questions that I'm thinking people are really wrestling with and so I'm going to try and provide a little bit of content. I'm a bit rusty because I've been away from this project for some time for other just unrelated reasons, so bear with me if you can, but I read the comments and I'm thinking, 
man, it just puts me right back into that caretaking scenario that I was in. And it's just heartbreaking. So if I can be of some assistance, I'm going to try and be. And that's what I'm going to be gearing up to do. I got a video on how hard is it to be a caretaker. I mean, not that many people don't already know that, but just to sort of talk through some of those issues. But for now, if you found this presentation of value, I do ask you to click the like button. I know that it's somewhat hard to want to click the like button for anything that has to do with something like Alzheimer's. But the like button lets me know first that you have found value in it. And it also, frankly, helps from the standpoint of YouTube to give the channel some vitality and some longevity. And I would appreciate that gesture. Don't forget to, to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. Please know that you have all my best wishes for your caregiving and for your loved one. And I do thank you for watching. Thanks so much.